Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Almuneda, Alonso Herrero, uh, coming from uh, Spain, uh, Madrid. Uh, she's at the center of uh, astrobiology, although there are a lot, a lot of extragalactic uh, uh, astronomers over there. And uh, Almuneda did, his, uh, did her PhD, sorry, uh, in Madrid, then went for a postdoc in Oxford, the University of Arizona. Uh, she was uh, part of the instrument team of the NICMOS uh, camera uh, on board the Hubble Space Telescope and also the MIPS camera, an infrared camera on board the Spitzer telescopes. And she's uh, an expert of uh, AGN studies, uh, starburst galaxies. She's very much interested in the dynamics and the feedback uh, uh, mechanism in uh, in AGNs. And she will tell us uh, today. She's part of. She's very involved in the James Webb MIRI uh, guaranteed time observations. She leads the group of the nearby galaxies observations uh, from the GTO time. And uh, Almudeda will tell us today about uh, a work she did with uh, this uh, GATOS collaboration. She will tell us uh, about, about the kinematics and uh, studies of molecular gas close to the central engines of uh, AGN. Amunda, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre, and everyone here. Thank you very much for the invitation and the uh, chance to tell you a little bit about the work uh, we are doing uh, within the GATOS collaboration, uh, which stands for Galactic uh, Activity Torus and Outflow Survey. Uh, so I'm giving this, this talk in, uh, on behalf of the whole collaboration. And today in particular, I would like to, to tell you a little bit about the uh, molecular dusty torus uh, of active galactic nuclei. And uh, let's see, I'm not sure why it's not. Ah, like that. Okay, so let me uh, uh, first introduce uh, this this concept of the molecular dusty torus and how it, it came came about. So actually, for many years, we've known that uh, active galactic nuclei have uh, different observational properties, but in general, we we classify them in two types: type one and type two. Type one, type one objects, so cipher ones or quasars. Uh, have uh, both uh, broad and narrow lines. So uh, the broad lines come uh, from a region very close to the accretion disk of the uh, active galactic nucleus, whereas the, uh, the narrow lines come from a much larger region, uh, generally hundreds of parsecs, which is called the narrow line region. Whereas the type twos, basically we classify them as type twos because we don't see the broad lines. Uh, but what it turns out is more than 30 years ago when um, type two galaxies, if two galaxies were observed in polarized uh, lights, uh, uh, we detected these broad lines. So basically this gave us the idea, these type one and type twos, uh, type one, type two agents are the same kind of objects. And it basically we have some obscuring material very close to the accretion disk that is blocking the, uh, uh, our direct view of the central engine in this type two galaxy. So this obscuring material uh, we call it the, uh, uh, the torus, the dusty molecular torus, because it was already proposed that it, would, it should be composed of dust and, and molecular gas, and it's the central piece of what we call the AGN unified model. Sorry, going the other way. So, uh, so basically, in this uh, in this animation, you can see basically this is exactly what I told you. So, depending on on our line of, of sight to the central region, to the central agent of, uh, uh, of this agent, we would classify the galaxy uh, in type one or type two. So this, this uh, molecular uh, dusty torus was proposed and um, for many years, we did not know too, too much about its properties. Something as simple as its size, we were, there were competing models, right? Uh, saying whether it should be very close, very compact, maybe one parsec across in size, or maybe a lot more extended, like a hundred parsecs. <clears throat> so we had a lot of uh, indirect uh, evidence for the presence of these torus, apart from, from the observations in polarized uh, lights. Uh, we also had uh, the presence in a lot of these uh, nearby cipher galaxies. Uh, we detect what is called these ionization cones that you can see here for the Cicinus uh, galaxy. So they are detected in ionized uh, gas. In this case, we can see a combination of H alpha and oxygen three lines. And basically, this is telling us this, this shape, these ionization cones uh, are already telling us that there is something that is collimating, right? This, this extended emission that is actually these ionization cones are basically the narrow line region in, in these different galaxies. 
Another piece of uh, uh, another piece of information uh, that tell us about the presence of this obscuring material in the central regions is that we, when we compare type one and type two, um, uh, we can see that there are some properties that are isotropic in the sense that. Uh, they are the same for type 1s and type 2s. For instance, oxygen 3 that comes from the narrow line region. You can see there are mid infrared, oxygen 4 line, uh, the mid infrared continuum, radio, the very hard x rays. So if you compare type 1s and type 2s, they look the same. And you can see here uh, in this diagram here the comparison between the oxygen 4 uh, line in the mid infrared and the radio uh, at 6 nanometers. And you can see the cipher 1s and cipher 2 behave the same. However, there are other, uh, other properties that we say are anisotropic and in, in the sense that in type two, they are obscured. For instance, the UV radiation or the soft X-rays and sometimes even in Compton thick uh, AGNs, the, the hard X-rays. So you can see here in this other diagram here, you can see that cipher twos appear like obscured in, uh, for some properties. So about 15 years ago, with the uh, uh, with the, the new mid infrared in, um, interferometric uh, instrument on the VLT, VL, uh, so the VLTI, we started making very high uh, angular resolution observations in the mid infrared. So in the mid infrared, we are going to be uh, sensitive to to relatively warm uh, emission from dust. So actually, when uh, 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 Tristram and collaborators did uh, the first observations for Circinus, the Circinus galaxies are very nearby AGN, uh, very bright. Uh, they could uh, already find evidence of this uh, very compact uh, structure. So they 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 basically they did not have a lot of visibility. So they had to should produce models right to interpret the observations. But they saw evidence for the presence of the, uh, two components, and the size the size of these components was relatively compact between one and ten uh, parsecs. Another very uh, nearby and bright uh, AGN is NGC 1068. It's also another Cipher two galaxy. And here we can see, uh, this is the uh, uh, a keg image uh, taken in the mid-infrared. So this is uh, probing uh, warm dust. Uh, so we, we can see that there is a uh, warm dust on large scales and hundreds of parsecs that tends to be uh, coincident with the ionization cone. And here is just the, uh, uh, the MIDI, the interferometric image in the mid-infrared. Again, with these uh, observations, which were uh, from a few years ago, they could see different components, but again, they, they, they could not reconstruct the images very easily. So these are actually model images. In my opinion, the big uh, revolution came with, with ALMA. Uh, with ALMA, uh, we targeted a few years ago, again, NGC 1068. And for the first time, we were able to really uh, detect the molecular dusty torus in this galaxy. Of course, we had very good angular resolutions, as you can see there. And what we found for NGC 1068 that is that the most of the coal dust, that is what we are probing with ALMA, the coal uh, dust and the coal molecular gas, we saw that it was in the equatorial direction, so basically perpendicular to these ionization cones. So clearly that gave us an indication that we were detecting the torus for the first time. Uh, the other interesting result was that actually the torus was slightly larger than we thought it would be. We, we had this uh, uh, idea from the mid infrared interferometry that was going to be very compact, but it turns out that for 1068, and we'll see for other cipher galaxies, it's a lot larger. It can go up to 30 uh, parsecs in diameter, depending on, on what uh, uh, molecular gas transition you're using. And now, very recently, just uh, last year, there were new uh, Matisse interferometric observations of NGC 1068. And actually, this image is beautiful because you can see that now with, uh, with Matisse, they can really produce beautiful images. And here you can see that they detected, again, in NGC 1068, two components. They saw emission in the equatorial uh, direction, so basically similar to the direction we detected with ALMA, compatible with this size, the relatively large size that we measure with ALMA. But also they saw the emission in the polar, in the polar direction here that you can see here. So actually, uh, and this polar direction uh, is, of course, by, by its own name, is, is perpendicular to the, uh, to the ALMA emission. So now we're starting to get these this, uh, more pieces of evidence showing, showing us how, uh, showing us that the things are a bit more complicated than we thought uh, from the, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. In fact, the, uh, the polar emission, this extended dust emission is, is very well known to be even on larger scales, as I saw you. 
So you can see here a compilation of, of images of uh, nearby Cipher galaxies. In this, what we are seeing here is the very central region and the point source has been subtracted. So we can actually see the diffuse extended emission. So it turns out that in most of these efforts, when we compare the orientation of this extended mean infrared emission with uh, the narrow line region, we tend to see this extended dust emission in the direction of the, uh, of the ionization cone. And that's why we call it this polar dust. Although in some cases we can see extended components in other directions. So now we have, a, 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 the, we have a, a better picture of this obscuring material around the AGN, and I will keep calling it a torus just for, you know, just for tradition, but just keep in mind that this torus is a bit more complicated uh, structure. We believe it's a multi-component, multi-kinematic uh, structure. And what is important here is that it's connected with the host galaxy. So with this torus is not isolated and we'll see now a few uh, ALMA images. And also what is important here is also that you need to get multi-wavelength observations to trace different parts of the torus. So for instance, if you uh, get near infrared or mid infrared observations, you're gonna be more sensitive to the inner parts because it's hotter dust. Whereas if you wanna be more sensitive to the whole extent of the torus, for instance, you, you need ALMA, right? Because it's gonna be more sensitive to the extended coal dust and, and gas emission. At the same time, our, our models for the torus have been evolving with time. So, I mean, this, I just show you uh, just a, a few examples of, of a, a large number of torus models we have uh, these days. So of course the first uh, few models uh, developed uh, uh, more than 30 years ago now by Pierre and Krolik. They actually distributed the, uh, the dust in a uniform way just because from computational reasons it was easier. They, of course they figured out and they were aware that the dust in the, in the ISM is in clouds, but the first models had the dust uh, distributed in uniform uh, fashion. Then we started uh, producing uh, more uh, realistic models, uh, what we call the clumpy torus models, where the, the dust is in clumps, and maybe you can even have an intermediate uh, uh, an inter uh, clump uh, medium, so to be more realistic. Here you can see, uh, for instance, these, these models by uh, uh, Sebastian Honig and Kishimoto. They put the, uh, the, dust, the, uh, the dust clumps not only in the torus, but also in this polar direction. And of course, now in the last few years, uh, we are starting to get uh, even more realistic models having these hydrodynamical simulations where you can actually also predict the, uh, the kinematics. So what are we doing with the, uh, with the, uh, the within the GATOS collaboration? I, I just showed you uh, uh, basically uh, the very nice observations about the NGC 1068, but I think we felt a few years ago that we really needed to, to move to samples of local agents. So not only study 1068, which is the prototypical C42 galaxy, but samples of galaxies. So this is what we did in the GATOS collaboration. We selected uh, a sample of relatively nearby uh, cipher galaxies. We, we uh, limited our distances to less than 40 megaparsecs just because we want to keep our angular resolution, our physical resolutions good enough, right? So we can resolve the torus. And we selected our targets uh, using uh, ultra hard X-ray observations for, from sweet pads, just to be, uh, uh, to be, I mean, just to get a relatively complete sample of, of uh, local AGNs. As you can see here, we have a nice range of uh, AGN luminosities, almost two orders of magnitude. And also uh, we have a nice range of, of nuclear of, of obscuration. So if we uh, take the, the, uh, uh, the hard X-ray column densities as, as an indication of the nuclear obscuration, you can see we, we cover a nice range of going from almost unabsorbed uh, sources all the way to Compton thick sources or so very embedded sources. And in the last few years, we've been uh, uh, compiling uh, high angular resolution observations, uh, ALMA, optical IFU, mid infrared imaging and spectroscopy and, and now uh, James Webb. So I'm just gonna show you a few, uh, few of the uh, most uh, recent results that we've been getting first with ALMA and then I'll show you some uh, James Webb uh, observations. Here are just the main goals of the uh, of the GATOS collaboration, and I just I'm, I'm not going to go through all these uh, these goals, but you can see that in in general we are interested in understanding the nature of the torus material and how it's connected to the uh, to the ISM of the galaxy. So how is this uh, obscuring material connected to the, the as I said to the host galaxy and whether there is an evolution, right? Whether the properties of the torus uh, depend on properties of the AGN. 
And also, uh, we want to connect that with the, uh, with the kinematics, with what's happening with the, the ionized and the molecular gas in these in this, uh, environments. So let me start with uh, just a few uh, ALMA results. Uh, so for the first uh, uh, observations we, uh, we obtained, we actually uh, limited our observations to um, uh, 12 galaxies. So we cut our, our, our distances to less than 20, 28 megaparsecs because we were still not sure about the size of, of the torus, so we wanted to be conservative. So basically here what I'm showing you is the uh, uh, we obtained uh, uh, observations in, in the, uh, uh, at 870 microns and also the CO3 to 2 transition, uh, just to so probe the cold dust and the cold molecular gas. So these are uh, 870 micron images uh, where we actually subtracted the, the nuclear, the, the unresolved emission, because it might be related more to synchrotron. So basically what we have here is just the extended emission around the, uh, the AGN. Um, to us, it was quite surprising because in all 12 galaxies, we detected this cold dust emission. And in general, we found that it was very extended. So now on, on average, the, uh, the size of this material is 40, 40 parsecs, but we are detecting uh, large tori, in some cases, all the way to 60 parsecs. So that was the first uh, surprise because as I said, for many years, we thought that the obscuring material was a lot more compact, but we are seeing with ALMA now is that it's extended. The other important important result, of course, is that I'm calling this the torus because uh, here you can see the uh, uh, plotted in, in blue and red is the orientation of these ionization cones. So in most cases, we, we find that the, um, the 870 micron extended emission is along the equatorial direction. So we can be sure that is uh, is tracing the, uh, the equatorial material, but in some cases, we also see a little bit of emission uh, along the polar uh, direction. So actually just to show you this nice uh, composition for seven of our, our galaxies where we I combined uh, the uh, ground-based uh, mid-infrared uh, extended emission so that we, in most cases, it would be along the, the, the direction of the ionization cone with the ALMA uh, observations. And you can see that exactly in the mid-infrared, we are mostly seeing emission in the polar direction. With ALMA, we are seeing mostly emission in the, uh, in the uh, equatorial direction. From the ALMA observations, we could actually measure the, uh, the masses, so in, in uh, the gas masses, and uh, we actually, we could get them either from the CO3 to 2 transition or from the, uh, uh, the 870 micron emission. And we can see that using those two, two tracers, we get a relatively good agreement. And the typical masses for, for this torus, this tori, is 10 to the six uh, solar masses. So they are relatively massive. Uh, uh, structures. I think what is more interesting is um, the comparison between the X-ray column densities. I re remember that I told you that's a good tracer, tracer of the nuclear obscuration with the column density we measure with ALMA right at the AGM position. And as you can see from, from this plot here, you can see that in, in, in general, there is a good correlation between the, the two column densities. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's a good relation. So this is telling us that the uh, uh, ALMA-identified tori are contributing to this nuclear obscuration. And in, in the future, and we are already getting much higher angular resolution observations with, with ALMA, and we are actually, actually, when we actually can look at very close, uh, like on scales of a few parsecs, one, three parsecs, we see that these column densities even correlate better. So now we've seen that there is a lot of uh, gas and dust uh, in the nuclear regions of AGN. So actually we can uh, compare uh, um, our observations with, uh, with uh, simulations that take in into account the effect of the AGN radiation pressure, not only on the gas, which is generally what we do and how you define the Eddington ratio, but actually taking the, uh, the uh, also considering the effect of the AGN radiation pressure on the dust. So here I'm just showing you uh, some simulations. Uh, the lines are uh, here simulations. Uh, in, in blue would be only considering the uh, radiation pressure on the, uh, on the gas, and the dust line would be considering the radiation pressure on, on the dust too. And basically using simulations, we, uh, we can actually see that depending on how much material you have in the nuclear region, you have a lot of material in the nuclear region, the simulations predict more like equatorial winds, whereas if you have sort of these intermediate column densities, you can actually predict these polar, polar winds, right? That probably are associated with the polar dust emission we are seeing. 
And basically the points I, I, I plotted in this diagram are our galaxies. And then also I coded them also with the uh, morphologies that we detected uh, in the mid infrared. And in general, what we find is that the galaxies where we detect this mid infrared polar dust emission tend to be close to, to the uh, prediction from the simulations. So this is giving us an indication that this extended polar dust uh, that we measure in the mid infrared might be related to this uh, you know, small scale winds, right? That are producing and lifting up, lifting up material from, from the torus. And actually, uh, when we looked uh, at uh, the kinematics of the molecular gas with ALMA, in a few, when we've done, done it for a few uh, uh, cases here, we do detect these uh, nuclear outflows in, in molecular gas. Uh, so we are looking at on scales very close to, to the agent and tens of parsecs. So we detect these uh, nuclear uh, outflows uh, with, uh, they are not very impressive numbers, but they uh, between 0.5 and a few solar masses per year. And in some cases we detected them along the equatorial direction, sometimes in the, uh, in the uh, uh, polar direction. So actually, we we can uh, ask ourselves was was what if if these uh, nuclear winds are doing anything right to the uh, molecular gas that we have in the central uh, regions of our Cipher galaxies? So this is what we've done here. So we are comparing uh, the the uh, mass surface density of the nuclear region of, of the torus on a scale of fifty parsecs compared to a circumnuclear region of about two hundred parsecs. And that, this is this uh, index, this uh, concentration index that is plotted here. So we're plotting the concentration index versus the AGN luminosity. So you can see that there is, there is a, a trend of having this, this uh, uh, concentration index becoming lower as you increase the AGN luminosity. And maybe it's easier to see it in, in these uh, two examples. So when you have a high concentration index, it means that you have a lot of material in the nuclear region. So your galaxy is somewhere around here. Whereas if you have a low concentration index, it means that in, your, in the nuclear region, I mean, there's still, for instance, in NGC 7582, there's still some molecular gas on, on, on torus scales because we detected the torus, but it's low compared to the circumnuclear uh, region. And this is basically, since we see that this concentration in this uh, decreases for higher AGN luminosities, this is probably telling us that uh, the AGN is this. Uh, is, we are seeing the effects of the AGN feedback on these very small uh, scales. So, in a simple scenario, uh, uh, to in uh, interpret these this, uh, these observations, basically we believe that the, the effects of these AGN winds in the nuclear regions is a, what it does is does a redistribution of the material on on scales of uh, hundreds of parsecs. So basically, we have here uh, low luminosity agents. Actually, in this uh, here in this diagram, we had the Gatos galaxies are here, and these are the Nuga galaxies. So Nuga galaxies are low luminosity agents. Uh, so basically, what we think is uh, when you have these low luminosity agents, so basically low luminosity agents, and also uh, relatively low uh, Eddington ratios. You have most of your material. You have a high concentration of material in the nuclear region. But then something happens, probably you're fueling more material into the, uh, uh, the very central region. Then you're producing these, these AGN winds, and then you start uh, clearing the material in the central region of, of the AGN. So basically, this is what we think we are uh, seeing in the Gatos galaxies, and that's how you know, we get this, this nice uh, correlation with AGN uh, luminosity. And maybe maybe there is a cycle, and then eventually something triggers the, uh, the fueling of the material, and then you go back to something that would look like a Nuga galaxy, and then you, this would probably explain this uh, cyclic, uh, cyclic behavior of AGNs. At the same time, we've been in trying to improve our, our uh, AGN, uh, our torus models. Uh, and since we've been seeing uh, that there is some, a lot of material also along the polar, polar direction and that material is extended, we actually modified uh, or, or explored the, in these this, uh, models, the CAT 3D wind models developed by Sebastian Honig and collaborators. We actually uh, produced some models that are uh, tailored to what we are seeing for the Gatos galaxies. And in particular, the most important thing is that we are distributing the, uh, the dust on larger scales based on, based on the ALMA results. So one nice thing that you can do with these models is you, you can produce these model images. So we've been producing uh, images in the mid infrared and far infrared. 
And uh, then you can, for different, I mean, these models have a lot of parameters, but you can produce these, these nice images that then you can compare with your observations. So here we, we have like a, a thin geometry in the sense that we have a relatively thin disk or torus and the, the, uh, in the polar direction, the dust is in, distributed in this hollow cone. So we have very thin walls in this cone. So you can see how the morphologies change depending on first whether you're looking at your galaxy in the mid infrared or the far infrared. In general, the far infrared will trace better the, the whole distribution of the, the, of the dust. But also if you make uh, your disk uh, thicker and the walls of your cone thicker, then you also change the, uh, you know, you, you can see that the morphologies are, are different. Of course, these are nice images, but these are the uh, original model, uh, this uh, um, resolution. Then you have to convolve with, uh, with, the with the angular resolution of your observation. So this is uh, something we did in, in this paper. And basically one main result from this comparison with the models is that to detect this polar dust emission actually is better to do it in the uh, in the far infrared with ALMA. So that's something that now we are we are doing with our higher angular resolution observations. So basically, this is a uh, what's next uh, for Gatos. So we are getting, as I said, we are getting new ALMA observations. So we want to get this um, um, uh, higher angular resolution observations, and we are getting now observations with two, three parsec resolution, just really to confirm that we are detecting uh, also this polar uh, emission, which is a bit uh, is, is fainter than the equatorial emission. We are also expanding the ALMA sample now. Actually, we are compiling observations from the archive just to, to see if we confirm the trend that we saw with the concentration index or the material in the nuclear regions compared to the circumnuclear regions. We are also uh, getting uh, James Webb observations, and I'll just go uh, into that in a minute. And then in the future, of course, we are uh, we are we will plan to to get observations with ELT, because, for instance, with with uh, Harmony, we would be able to get uh, physical resolutions comparable to what we are getting in with Alma. So we will be able to trace the uh, very hot uh, gas and dust in the in the nuclear regions. So let's uh, just move on to the uh, the James Webb. Uh, observations. Uh, so we got uh, the Gatos collaboration got two uh, cycle one uh, proposals accepted. The first one was to actually investigate this polar dust emission. So we selected eight uh, Cipher galaxies where uh, we knew from the ground that they had this extended emission, this extended uh, mid infrared emission. Uh, and then we chose uh, 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 to get observations in with MIRI, so in the mid infrared with uh, five filters. So this proposal, the uh, this proposal, the PIs are David Rosario and Sebastian Honig. So you can see these are our eight uh, galaxies. So they already observed. So you can see these very nice uh, morphologies, and you can also notice that there is all of them show a very bright point source in in the center. These are mostly Cipher two galaxies, but now in the mid infrared, all the uh, Cipher two galaxies are also super bright in the mid infrared, as you would expect since you have uh, less obscuration. The second cycle one proposal was to use the IFU mode of, of MIRI, uh, the MRS. Uh, the uh, PIs are Taro Simitsu and Rick Davis. And for, for this proposal, we chose uh, six uh, Cipher galaxies where we also had evidence of the, the presence of these uh, uh, outflows uh, detected in the in ionized gas. So the idea is to understand the uh, these dusty winds and uh, also look at the PHs, mid infrared continuum, et cetera. And then in cycle two, we got two more proposals accepted. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, um, just to look at the, the emission from the PAHs in the very central regions of, of the Cipher galaxies. This proposal was led by Ismael Garcia Bernete and Dimitri Rigopolo. So the idea here is to study the effect of the AGN on, on the PAHs, on, this, on these molecules, on scales ranging from tens of parsecs to hundreds of parsecs. And actually we had, uh, preliminary results uh, here for NGC 1068 uh, using uh, early release observations. And, and uh, you can take a look at this, this paper if you're interested in PHs, but unfortunately I don't have time to, to talk about that. And uh, the second cycle two proposal uh, was uh, led by uh, Takuma Itsumi. And it's again another MRS, uh, MIRI MRS uh, proposal. 
to study the Circinus galaxy. Remember, I showed you uh, observations at the beginning of the talk. This is a very nearby Seifert uh, galaxy. It's only at four uh, megaparsecs, so we can actually get very, very good uh, physical resolutions of the order of uh, uh, six parsecs. The only inconvenience is that it's very bright in the mid infrared, so it has a very bright uh, 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 point source in the center. So we're still waiting to get the observations, but they should be uh, quite uh, challenging probably to remove this uh, point source. And actually speaking of these very bright point sources that the Cipher galaxies uh, have, I'm just showing you uh, one of the uh, galaxies in our imaging uh, sample. It's NGC 5728, again, it's a Cipher 2 galaxy. And you can see here the, uh, the original uh, imaging uh, taken with the five filters. So we actually combined the five filters, color coded. And actually we started with this one because it does have a bright point source, but it's not the brightest uh, point source. And because we are interested in uh, studying the, uh, this very diffuse extended emission, we are tr uh, trying different techniques to actually minimize the effects of the uh, bright point source. In this case, we are using the convolution techniques. And you can see here in the deconvolved uh, image, we can clearly uh, detect emission um, around the, uh, uh, the central, the, the AGA here, you can still see uh, the diffraction spikes and the residuals of the diffraction spikes. But we clearly detect uh, this uh, extended emission in the mid infrared. And actually we compare with, the, uh, with uh, some previous uh, symphony observations, we can actually see that is, is related to what we are seeing with, uh, with uh, symphony. So we are seeing mid infrared emission al along the polar direction, which is nice because that's what we were looking for. Now, one thing we need to figure out is the line contamination in, in these imaging filters. So we have to, do, we want to separate what is coming from just high ionization uh, lines that are within the filters and what's coming from the dust. But that will be for the future. And now just in the last uh, few minutes, just moving on to the uh, uh, the mid infrared uh, spectra, uh, in particular, um, just the nuclear spectra. So we've, we've had in, in this cycle one proposal, we have five galaxies already observed. And then we used uh, another uh, galaxy uh, from a near proposal, which is this uh, NGC 7319. So basically you can see here, these are the, uh, the nuclear spectra. So we are talking on, uh, about scales of uh, 30, 60 parsecs. So more or less co covering the, uh, the torus scales that we uh, uh, measure with ALMA. And you can see that it's, uh, it's nice because these, uh, these six galaxies also have a nice range in, in X-ray column densities. So you can see uh, galaxies uh, going from this M MCG, 0, 05, blah, 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 which is relatively not very absorbed, all the way to uh, galaxies, these two galaxies that are almost uh, close to the Compton thick uh, uh, limit. So you can see this is the uh, complete uh, 5 to 25 micron spectra from, from Miris. So you can see, these are very uh, rich uh, data sets. So we can see there are a lot of uh, uh, fine structure lines, a lot of H2 lines. So um, there's gonna be a lot of, these are on the, the nuclear uh, spectra, but we, in all these galaxies, actually all the emission is extended. It's not only coming from, from the AGM, but it's coming from also from the circumnuclear regions. So plenty of uh, H2 lines, as I said, and fine structure lines. We also detect, of course, the, uh, uh, the dust, uh, uh, dust continuum and, and silicate features at 9.7 and 18 microns. We also see a pH emission, as, uh, so that's one of our, our goals also for, with this proposal. Uh, of course, the pH emission is, is, is faint compared to the strong uh, continuum, but it, it is detected. So, that was one thing we have to uh, uh, understand. In particular, we detect nicely, the one I'm marking here is the 11.3 micron pH emission. So that is, uh, is well detected in all the, uh, the galaxies in our sample. But we also are uh, starting to see, because the spectral resolution is much better than we, what we had with Spitzer, we are starting to detect other, other absorption features that were not detected in, in the past. So in particular, uh, here you can see clearly see that there are some extra um, absorption features. So this is something, this is uh, some work uh, which has been uh, recently submitted by Ismael, Ismael Garcia Bernete. So actually uh, we, uh, uh, we realized that the, these absorptions that we were seeing around six microns correspond to absorptions uh, uh, due to water, water ices. 
Uh, so here, what you can see in this, this image here, what we are plotting here is just the, uh, the optical depth. So basically we are dividing the, uh, the absorptions by the continuum. It's a simple apparent optical depth. So you can see that we, uh, and then we compare with NGC 4418, which is was well known to, to show these absorption features. So we can actually see in particular for the two galaxies in our sample that are Compton thick, we can see that we can detect uh, uh, these absorption features due to, to water, especially the one around uh, six microns, but maybe also uh, this absorption, this broad absorption around also 13 microns. And we also see uh, other absorptions around uh, 685 and 725 microns that are due to uh, hydrogenated amorphous, car amorphous carbons, okay? So actually this, this, uh, this uh, especially the six micron ice feature was already well known uh, from old ISO observations and Spitzer observations, and they had been mostly detected in ULERGs or very embedded uh, sources. So here you can see uh, uh, a nice uh, compilation by uh, Henrik Spoon and collaborators from, from last year, where they compare again the, uh, this very embedded uh, source NGC4418 and two uh, ULERGs. So you can see here uh, in, in solid line, these are the observations and they are comparing with some uh, lab uh, templates uh, for uh, water, um, water ice at different temperatures and also these amorphous uh, carbons. But what is interesting for, for, this, uh, uh, for our CIFR galaxies is that we, we, try, we, are, we were trying to understand when these, these uh, ices are observed, right? So to, to have these ices, you have to have relatively uh, very low temperatures. That's something you would not expect in an AGN. Near an AGN, you would expect to have a lot of uh, UV photons, and therefore you wouldn't expect in principle to detect these ices. It turns out that when we plotted the, uh, the optical depth, this apparent optical depth of the, uh, the water ices, against the, again, the nuclear hydrogen column densities that we measure from, from X-rays, we see a, a, a trend uh, for our CIFR galaxies. So th those are the, uh, the black points that you can see there. So basically, in cases where we see high uh, absorptions, high column densities in X-rays, we also tend to detect these, these, uh, these absorption features uh, due to the water ices. And also we added uh, for this comparison, uh, some ULERGs observed, uh, as I said, well-known ULERGs to, to, to show this uh, water, um, water ices. So basically, uh, our conclusion from, from this preliminary work, because we only have a few sources, is that you tend to observe these this water uh, ices, these absorptions produced by water ices in very embedded regions. And so in these cases, you have a lot of uh, column densities and very high column densities that basically, in a way, shield the clouds from the, the, the dust clouds, shield them from, from the AGN radiation. And uh, what happens is uh, the, the way we actually realized uh, what was happening is actually we were initially uh, comparing our, our nuclear um, spectra for the CIFR galaxies with Taurus models. So here you can see again NGC 7528. The, uh, the black uh, line is the observations where we removed all the emission lines and all the pHs, and we were just trying to compare with our torus models, right? And we realized that that's how we realized that uh, we were seeing all these absorptions, uh, as I said, due to water ices and, and other carbon features. So basically, when we compare with the models, we realize what's going on here. Of course, the models, these are only dust irradiative transfer models, so they only have dust. And so this is how we... Uh, we uh, realized uh, that these uh, were due to, to other material. And uh, so basically the, uh, the idea we have now for, for the, uh, the uh, Taurus models uh, is actually uh, ask our people in our, in our group, in our collaboration or other groups is actually to include other ingredients for, for these, these models in particular, of course, to include these ICs and maybe also these PHs. And I, and I know some uh, uh, models for protoplanetary disks, uh, which are in a way similar to these uh, Taurus models, do already incorporate these ingredients. So this is something we, we want to do for, for our, our, uh, within our collaboration. And this is a, a very nice cartoon where maybe I, I'm trying to explain when we would expect to find these, these uh, ICs. 
of course, to, as I said, to have these ICES, we need to have very embedded uh, sources. So basically, we think that the ICES uh, are coming from the outer part, uh, outer uh, regions of this dusty tori, but also have, they have to be in very embedded sources, maybe sources that have a lot of material, or maybe the, the, the dust distribution is not clumpy. And, and in that way, uh, you protect, basically, you are not irradiating these dust screens with UV photons from, from the AGN, so you can actually have these, these ice-coated uh, dust screens. But uh, this is still something uh, we need to, to get more observations. Uh, we are already, uh, as I said, getting cycle two observations. And we are, uh, for one galaxy we looked at uh, recently, we, we detected this ice uh, absorption. And it's also a galaxy where we know there's high column density from X-rays. So it looks like this is uh, this uh, the, the, we are finding the same result. So in the future we will have more observations to actually to to try to uh, um, in particular I think uh, uh, to try to see if this correlation stays because this would give us uh, getting this uh, measuring this water ices uh, will give us another estimate of the nuclear obscuration in, in galaxies. In particular, in the past, we've been using the silicate features in, in these nearby cipher galaxies, but sometimes the silicate features can be uh, contaminated by uh, dust in the host galaxy. So we believe with these ices, we might be able to penetrate more into the torus uh, scales and get another, uh, at least an alternative estimate of the of the nuclear obscuration. And and I think just as just uh, to finish my talk, I just want to 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 have a few take home messages. So basically, the idea that I wanted to to uh, uh, convey today was that the torus that would I put in, in quotes, uh, you know. Uh, so the obscuring material around AGNs is a, is a complicated structure. We now are getting evidence that it's a multi-phase, multi-scale, a multi-kinematic structure. I did not talk too much about uh, kinematics, but, but yes, we are seeing that the kinematics is very complicated. And this structure goes all the way from less than a parsec to tens of parsecs. Depending on what, as I said in the, uh, the earlier, depending on on what part of the torus or what component of the torus you wanna you wanna study, you need to get uh, different observations. So in principle, the idea what is best and what is what we are trying to get is to get infrared to millimeter observations, so we can actually probe the different components of the. Uh, of the torus. We also, we are interested on in understanding the properties of the obscuring, obscuring material. So we've seen dust composition, geometry pHs. We believe these, uh, uh, these properties are likely to be uh, dependent on the AGN uh, properties. And this is what we will be doing in the next uh, few months. And uh, another thing that I just said at the, the very end of my talk is that we, we think that the models need to incorporate uh, new ingredients and to make more realistic models so we can compare with, with our observations. And with this, I will just finish my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Almuneda. Any questions? Thank you. That was a very nice talk. Um, could you go back to the slides where you're showing the SEDs with the silicate absorption features? Because oh, um, you showed very nicely this correlation between the ice optical depth and the H1 equivalent column. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I looked at the silicate absorption features, there doesn't really seem to be any relation. So yes, yes. Is that due to contamination from the host galaxy or...? Yes, we believe that in some cases, for instance, in the NGC 7172, that's, the galaxy is almost a on. So we know in that particular case, it's quite contaminated by, by the host uh, galaxy. Actually, I think I can show you the... Uh, so you can see there, 7172 is clear that very deep silicate features are probably more related to dust in the uh, dust lanes in the host galaxy. In other cases, in... Uh, this one, uh, 5728, is more phase on, so there's maybe not so much uh, contamination from the host galaxy. It's simply that getting the, uh, at least in the clumpy torus models, we know that it's not very, it, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between what you measure, the, the apparent uh, depth of the silicate features, and your true obscuration in, in clumpy media. So, so that's why you also have to get different uh, estimates of the nuclear extinction. So basically, you cannot get measure the, the optical depth of the silicate feature and say, this is whatever 
extinction is, is a bit more complicated than that. Right, thanks a lot. But this was well known also from, from Spitzer observations that people already figured that there is no good, if you plot the depth of the silicate feature against the column density you get from X-rays, in many cases there is no good correspondence. So the nice thing with, with the JS web, now we can even go to even smaller physical scales within the mid infrared and probably confirm this, even on scales of tens of parsecs is the case. At least we saw one case, 71, 72 is the case, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your talk, uh, but I have two like, more general questions. The first question, uh, have you did the comparison between the properties of uh, dust uh, torus that you see in different galaxies with the properties of broad wine regions? In, the, in your idea, and the second question is also related to the first one. Uh, given the kinematics of broad wine components, broad wine regions is widely used uh, for the mother estimation determination of AGN of central black hole. Uh, have you studied or what you can comment on the influence or effect of uh, dust obscuration uh, of broad wine regions that? Uh, may affect the viral estimates of black hole mass. Yeah, so we haven't done any any of the VLR uh, estimates, but there are estimates of the black hole uh, masses. Now, within the, the broad line region, we believe the dust is sublimated. So in principle, I mean, the broad line region is very, the size is generally less than one parsec. So that would be, uh, so the, 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 the temperature is too high for the dust. The dust does, will sublimate. So in that in that sense, uh, it would not be affected by dust, uh, I, I would think. And then, so so we don't, and then for, for our models, we are only considering for these uh, radiative transfer models, we are only considering dust. And it, this is dust outside the, as I said, outside of the broadline region. I'm not sure if that answers your questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about the molecular hydrogen emission that you detect. Uh, can you separate the dusty uh, uh, and uh, nu uh, circular nuclear emission? And also, can you use the excitation diagram to study maybe? And also, another question, can you detect uh, uh, outflow in an emission, uh, H2 in outflows in this case? So basically, yeah, that's, I haven't uh, said anything about kinematics because this is basically what we are doing now. This is quite, uh, I mean, there's a lot of information. So uh, the one we've been looking at in more detail, NGC 5728, we do see a little bit of outflow uh, emission in the, for the molecular hydrogen lines. We do see the outflow in the fine structure lines. It's very clear, actually, in this galaxy. So they still uh, we still have to do a lot of analysis uh, and comparing the nuclear region with the extended region. So so that's still I would say work in progress for for this galaxy and the other galaxies in the sample. So in the next few months uh, we're hoping to have some results. Hello. So thank you for these extremely rich and uh, <laughs> exciting results in your talk. Uh, I have several questions, but I would like to to know. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there is a combination about the molecular gas of both uh, cold, uh, warm, and hot gas. Uh, you did not talk much about warm and hot gas. So mm -hmm. first, I'd like to know what you get from your JWST result about H2 uh, emission. And then... Uh, whether you can combine that with uh, tracers of uh, warm and hot gas that you have got in Alma with Gatos. So that's actually, so the people in our, in Gatos working on the simulations, they are actually now, st I mean, there were a few si uh, simulations, uh, the paper by Williamson um, collaborators with Sebastian Honig. They did uh, a few simulations for including the, uh, the warm uh, gas that we probe with uh, James Webb and with Alma. So they, they are already including that. At, at least they, they made a comparison for NGC 1068 and their simulations uh, match the observations. Of course, they, there are a lot of free parameters. Now they are producing more, uh, more realistic simulations. So the plan is actually to compare, well, especially with ALMA because we get much higher angular resolution. But hopefully once we isolate the, uh, or we separate out the uh, host galaxy from the nuclear emission, 
uh, with MIRI, we will compare also with the uh, the warmer molecular gas. Yeah. But that's something we, we are planning to do in the future is... Yeah, coming back to Alma, what are the useful tracer of a warm and hot gas? What am I using for tracers? In for tracer, you get uh, so with for, Alma for in ghettos. So for the warm gas, uh, we, we can use all the H2 lines in the mid infrared. So we have these rotational lines okay. from S1 to S8. And then for the hotter molecular gas, we can use near infrared. Uh, there is the 2.12 uh, micron that is uh, traces hot gas. And then we have symphony so observation data for, for that. water. You, you Sorry? For, for water. It's not easy to observe water in your nearby galaxy. Yeah. So your data are Herschel data or? No, this this uh, water is, this is a uh, MIRI. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is the, um, Oh, here, here. Oh, yeah, this is ice. Okay. Yeah, but, these are ice. Okay, yeah. The gas water. Ah, uh, the gas phase. Uh, yeah, no, no. We think we are seeing just ice. Mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of its structure. We see more like a sort of smooth absorption. So we think it's, it's coming from ice. Yes. You presented your results in the frame of the standard model where the difference between type one and type two is due to orientation. orientation. Mm -hmm. But you know that the phenomenon of changing look quasars, which are changing from one to two, cannot be explained in this frame. Yeah. And, and the question is, is the change due to a change in obscuration or a change in the central activity? So I was wondering whether your model of dust uh, can yeah, give that... something on the distribution of blobs and time scale of changes and so on. Maybe, yeah, with the, uh, the uh, hydrodynamical simulations, that's something we can look into. Actually, one of our galaxies, NGC 50, uh, 7582, is uh, one of these changing look uh, galaxies. And it's, I think it's also variable in the mid infrared. So obviously, these radiative transfer models are static models. So that's, so maybe with the, uh, with the hydrodynamical simulations, we can start seeing how the material, we can put material going into the, uh, and that's actually one of some of the new simulations that, that they are doing that is, you know, putting material, you know, putting material into the, uh, the central region and having the outflow. So that's something maybe, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, this is the simple, I define, I explained a very simple, very simple, or oh, the simplified version of the unified model. But of course, we have to explain the changing look uh, galaxies. So, so that yeah, this is something we will hopefully try to uh, yeah to understand with uh, with these observations. Thank you. Hello, thank you for uh, thank you for the for your talk. Um, uh, you mentioned at some point uh, that uh, the there is an um, feedback effect at the smallest scale that you are you are seeing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, because this torus is at, at roughly speaking uh, something like one hundred parsec mm -hmm. or, or, or a smaller, you expect you expect uh, the it's going the other way. Never mind. You expect the, the central uh, nuclear cluster of uh, stars in that region. Now, my question is that uh, have you, especially in the, even if you, you cannot detect really directly the, the, the nuclear cluster, uh, can, have you tried to add it to your simulation to see how much this uh, the origin of this molecular gas is from the uh, the the black hole itself and how much from the star formation around it and so on yeah we haven't done it we, and we do know that in some of our galaxies we know there is nuclear star, there is a nuclear starburst so we we know that that's something else. Uh, yeah that's another extra ingredient we need to look into for instance when we look at the phs in the cases where we know there is a nuclear starburst we do, we do detect the ages, right? So yes, then we're making the model more and more complicated. So yeah, but it's, it's a good point that, yeah, there is also in some cases star formation. In so we don't know the, the origin of the, of these molecules, the star or the, the, the agent star? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's another thing to, yeah, to look into, definitely. Thank you. We have time for one more question. <laughs> I, I thank you very much for the talk. That was really great. I was surprised about the water ice. So the next question would be, would you also expect to detect water vapor? Or if it's not obscured, would it be dissociated immediately and you wouldn't expect to detect it? Do you have any guess? I, I, I've been wondering that myself, yes. Uh, so we only have five uh, galaxies now. 
So actually, uh, so that's one. Actually, I was asking uh, Ismael Garcia Bernet about that yesterday or two days ago. It's like when we would expect to see this uh, uh, the water in the in the gas phase. I think, in, as you said, in maybe in AGN environments, it's like a, probably the worst place to look for that because. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, uh, it's something we need to to understand, at, at least for me in these uh, nearby agents, because in some other targets, uh, not in the Gato sample, we do see the uh, the water in, in the, the gas uh, gas phase. So we need to understand when and how, when, in what conditions, under what conditions we can see it. I mean, the ISIS, I think we can get an idea, right? If something is very embedded, very shielded, then temperatures are can be low enough to have the ISIS. The gas phase, uh, yeah, we, we need to look into that. Thank okay, you. Okay, if there are no more urgent questions, let's uh, thank Anne Mulena again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.